Good afternoon, Colin Leslie. Welcome to Talk Badminton. Good afternoon, Martin. Nice to be actually on. <laughs> <laughs> no, instead, of, instead of watching and seeing me piss to the, piss to the backside out of everybody. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, doing that. You're fine. Uh, it's great what, what videos is on there already, so you're, you're fine. No, that's good. Any names that you know? Lyndon, what, Lyndon Williams, you know him? Yes. Um, he actually was one of my first coaches. when I joined the Lothian Disability Badminton Club. Really? Um, I didn't know it existed. Um, obviously, I had an accident at work, and for 10 years, I'd done nothing. So, And then it was David Cunningham Jr. that told me about the club. And so I went along and said to him, look, I'd like to join. I was a badminton player before I had my accident. Never thought I'd ever do any kind of sport again. And I said to him, well, I'll give you an hour because the club runs for two hours. So I says, well, I'll give you an hour because I'm in a DAPS team and the DAPS is on the night. So gave him an hour. And in that hour, he had me entered in two tournaments. He had me, um, what me to come back. And he just, yeah. and that's the first time I actually yeah. met him. So and what, and that was really bad. And did you have a history of badminton at all? In fact, let's go to the questions, right? I'm going to go to the questions. That's a, if that's okay, let's get it in sequence. So your full name? It's Colin Edward Leslie. And where's the Edward from? That's my father's name. Nice. Leslie. And what age are you call? Uh, I don't want to say, but I'll be <laughs> 50 in April. Yeah, that's good. I was 50 in December there. Thank God. All right, see that was 15 December, I was a uh, uh, good. Uh, and you, where are you from originally? Where, did, where were you born? Um, born in Edinburgh, lived in Musselburgh till I was about two, and then um, moved out to Mayfield and Dalkeith. in Dalkeith area. And I've been there ever since, moving about Mayfield, Newton Grange, um, and Dalkeith. So I've been in there the rest of my days. So oh, Midlothian. Mm -hmm. Midlothian, yeah. And do you have any brothers or sisters, Carl? I have three younger sisters. Well, any of them Bowden players? No. Um, at the very beginning, remember, when we were kids, my parents used to work in a leisure centre, so Is that right? um, they used to play then, but then they just didn't have any interest in sport at all. So I'm the only sport the one in the family. What so. leisure centre was that? That was Mayfield Leisure Centre. Right? Ah, good. Yeah. So, um, it's hard, isn't it? When you have family, they work in a leisure centre. That's like the dream, isn't it? Anytime you want yeah. to get in the hall, you can get in. That's my, that's my well, family. It was it me because I could get in any sport I wanted and didn't have to wait on a way really? list, which was great. Amazing. Um, and then, I mean, I've done every sport. Did Under you? the sun, basketball, so, all that, everything. Um, so I it was it was great and took up the bandman and enjoyed so was it. Like a, was it like a caretaker kind of idea? Was he just looking after the place and he could could you get in any time, like if it was closed, whatever, or what was that like? It was mostly my mum because she was working in the canteen at the um leisure center. Hi. And then she would tell put at reception or help put put the, the equipment out and what have you. But way back then there was a badminton club and they used to all play, so it was all old gens that used to play. And it was then that that's when I got introduced. So I'd be about five year old. Was it brilliant? Isn't when it? I first picked a badminton racket up I so Four uh, or five years ago. Uh, what age were you when you first played? That's that answered five. That's a, that's that's early, right? Uh, good. And and why did you start playing? Just really because your mum was that. Was there a club that went on from in the same hall? Was it? Or? I can't remember. Also, did your mum or dad play? Did your mum or dad? Did your mum or dad play? Both of them. Both of them. Both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Both of them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and getting coached at the centre oh. with Robbie Robertson. Um, and when he wasn't there, it was David Cunningham Senior. And then for there, continued on through um, so uh, teenage was, years and is, kept what, it going. What age was that coaching? Kind of jumping ahead here a wee bit. Oh, it would have been... Oh, I really can't mind, maybe. I can't mind they've been getting coached like five-year-old. Aye, so it would have been a wee bit later, maybe seven or eight. Oh, you know, really, as old as, as, as young as that. Aye. And what about as your dad? Young as that, did, been... dad go and, did your dad come and call and give you coaching when you were young? Nah, no, my dad, nah. Are you mum? Um, but I would never listen to him and then he would just get <laughs> angry at me. So, <laughs> But my ma was always on the sidelines or working, and that's how I got into the centre quite a bit. Eh? So, so I. Um, there would be clubs, so as soon as you finished school, I would run to the club and then start getting coaching. Oh, yeah. To the point, when I became a teenager and that, I started doing coaching myself. Oh, really? So that was a long time ago, and you didn't need a ticket or anything. So I used to help out mm -hmm. coaching the younger ones coming in, and I think that's where it really all stemmed for was for there. Oh. So, and did, uh, you, did you become the main coach at the school kind of thing, or the after school thing, or? What age were you then? No, well? no, I was still the understudy big Robbie oh. uh, Robertson. Um I was always under him. Um but if he was ever late, I would just set up the equipment and what have you until I came in, because he would have to travel from Pennycook right. or he would have be then coaching at school or something like that to get to the, the, the centre. So Ah, it was great. It was and what kind of well, coach was he? Was he was he a good player himself? Was he a very structured, or was it more about the fun for him? Or what do you think of that? Robbie was straight to the point, but you listened to him. Uh, if you didn't listen to him, he made you sit down and you didn't the day, and um, you didn't get on court until you either apologised him or he put his size eighteen foot up your backside. <laughs> That's how big he was. I mean, it, you he... think David. David Cunningham Senior, or sorry, Junior, as tall, but Robbie was like 20, <laughs> 22 stain, and he was just like a giant to us, absolutely massive. And <laughs> wow. you listened to him, so yeah. you didn't muck about, you weren't sitting on the sidelines for long. And do you remember your first racket is the next question? Oh my goodness, it would have been an old Carl, and she's. Oh, I can't mind. It would have been an old carrot and three piece thing. No, probably a three point seven. I bet it was a three point seven X. We've already had that. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been far off three point seven or three point two, one or the other. Yeah. But I think I might have been lucky and got the lighter one. I I might have been lucky then. So, and um, and then so, the name of the club that you went to. Uh, it was um, what was it? Mayfield Banton Club. Is that still go? No. No. Nah. No, it's just sure it was just Mayfield Kids Badminton Club. That's, oh, cool. that's bad. I can't even mind what it was called. <laughs> it's going by a long way. Shocking. You're, you're allowed. You're going back a long way. Remember how much it cost and how often did he play? How often did he play? Um, back then, it was only you played on a Wednesday, four to six or something. So... I think it was like just once a week. Aye. And if we were really lucky and there was like a tournament coming up um, with the schools, then you got to go away to different areas. And usually it was Midlothian, but Pennycook that used to have the tournaments there. So, I mean, that's, I mean, Christ, that was 40 odd years ago. I'm trying and to back, think back. And back in the day, do you remember Diggy Walker? Douglas Walker, aye. He was the one that ran all the tournaments. Aye. Um, you did you well. ever go any coaching with him? Uh, very occasionally, I go coaching with him. Yeah. Aye. So um, he was, certainly around that time, he seemed to be the main coaching in about Edinburgh, wasn't he? He's, uh, for for Lothian area, he certainly was. I so yeah. Um, his first shuttles he used in uh, Mayfield, plastics or feathers? They would have been plastics, probably RSL plastic. <laughs> <laughs> and so what did you say your first ever coach was, Colin? Uh, as to my knowledge was Robbie Robertson. 
as my first coach. Do you remember the first thing you learned, Tom? Um, yes, it was don't speak until spoken to, <laughs> and then. <laughs> Sounds like, like a very principled like, yeah, coach. Yes. <laughs> I was and expecting then, I was expecting a grip or smash or overhead or footwork or something. No, no. it was <laughs> that then if the very first thing I think it was the high serve. Oh, yeah. Probably the high serve that he gave us I so uh, I. Uh, do you remember the first ever tournament you went in? No. no. It was a school thing, was oh, it? Did you go to school it would have been school? a school tournament, and more than likely it would have been a penny cook at Beeslack High School or something like that. Yeah. And what, what, did you like, what was your favourite? You, were you a singles player or a doubles player or a mixed player back then? Singles was my game. Um, and later on in life, it became mixed doubles was a better That's game it. for me. That's brilliant. Um, but as I'm getting older... This pre, is this before the accident? What age did you have the accident? Can I ask that? Sorry. Um, I had that accident in 2002, so nine, 19 years ago. So that was... Um, so, oh, was when was that accident? Right. Two. Hmm. 2002 was my accident um, in the January. I was getting married in the June of that same year. And then I lost one leg, 2004, and then I lost the other one in 2006. Can I ask what it was? Come on. I was being, I was actually, I'm a landscaper at the trade, so I was up a ladder taking ivy off a building down in Dunbar at East Lothian. And I took, I up the height of the ladder. Not like at the drain the level, at the drain level kind of thing, up at the top, I. Um, out of the, well, the height stuff. of the ladder was 30 feet, so I was up the very top there. I've come down the, the ladders and I've got to head tight where my dad was holding the ladder and I kicked him on the head, so he said, whoa, wait a minute. So he's went to turn round to the back of the ladder to let me come down and the ladder slid, pure accident, and I fell straight in between the ladder and straight on the concrete and for there... I actually got back up and walked, and we think that's where all the damage happened. Really? Because um, I've never had a broken bone in my life, and then I go and fall straight onto concrete, but I've landed on heels. I don't know what is gross anybody out, but the when I went for surgery the following day, the the head surgeon turned and just said porridge. He physically couldn't have piece a bone together, so. I broke the bones across the way, but shattered them up and down the way. So sure. that's so how bad it was. The, across the way and up and down. Well, no. Yes. Yeah. So it was there wasn't a, a there wasn't a piece of bone bigger than five millimeters, and they physically couldn't have piece them. They tried, but they couldn't. Have. And then for there, it was problem after problem. Every six months, I had an operation for two years, but the pain was just horrific. So was they, it? They took my left leg first in 2004. That was the June. So they tried everything on my right side. And then in the 2006, in the August, I decided to lose the right side. Right. So for there, I've been a double amp since 2006. So from the day of the accident, I thought I would never, ever play sport again. And then David Cunningham's come along. 2012 says our club started a few years ago get along there and here we are now talking about it and I know it's just mind blowing because I never ever thought I'd ever do sport again mm. and sport was my life and how did you get back how did it become uh, I guess uh, first of all I guess for that period of time um, there was a, how many years out was there where you couldn't really do sport and you know pre the accident were you doing sport right up to that point and then you was stopped top. for how long? How many years? Yeah, so I've been a sporting person. I actually trained in sports management at college and all the rest there. Um, right up to I had the accident, I was doing every single sport, four by fours, quads, outside, 
pain, you name it, I'll do it. The only sport I cannot un understand and I don't like is cricket. <laughs> I'll do anything else. I'll put my hand to anything. Then I had the accident and that was 10 years that I'd done absolutely nothing. For three of the years, I was awake for three years solid. I never slept in three really? years. Really? Uh, eventually, what, was, that, a was that straight after they both went? Straight after you'd lost them both? No, that was... Um, or pretty straight away after the first one? After the first one, more or less. So I um, guess you were in a wheelchair all that time before that, were you? Well, when you couldn't... I was more or less bedridden um, for a, a long time. Um, but they tried to get me up and gave me a false leg, but it took a year and a half for the swelling to come down on that. Um, so it took a long, long time. Um, and then from there, the I was that much down that I actually tried to take my life twice, but that was unfair to my wife then. And your baby, um, and your baby, right? Mm -hmm. The two youngest that I've I had, I had my son and my daughter. Um, but then I was being selfish to myself because I was on that much of a downer that I did try and take my life. And then I had a bottle of vodka opened. I had tablets in the other hand, and I went and fell, dropped them all, smashed the vodka. I never took it. Thank God I didn't, because I've had, I've now got another two daughters and family has been supportive all the way through um, including a lot of friends that they've pulled through and helped me through and the badminton seemed to help me as well on I doing think, that so i personally think you're a massive inspiration to anybody and i've been well, thinking I, a lot uh -huh. sorry i get that for quite a few people and um, as long if i can change one person yeah to, i've been the able side now i'm the disabled side I came what the two have gone through, how it happens, why it's happening and what have you. I'll go away and I'll do talks at universities to try and help doctors and students and try and find out if I've got a problem and then they see me, but you know what, a disability and then they see both legs. And then when I go to the Nationals up in Perth, there's, I can't even mind his name, but every time I play, I'm an inspiration to him. And... If I can change one person anytime, I'm happy with that. I just think it's absolutely incredible. I mean, it must be incredibly frustrating um, um, for for the, for disabled badminton to see. Um, I suppose it's human nature to take for granted what you've got, right? You know, it's human nature that well, you've got what you've got, and then. You know, but I look at I've I've been doing a lot of thinking about disability and badminton and that kind of thing, and I think you know it it's almost you say it's a disability, but it's almost like a superpower. You know, to think about you know if I had to somebody said to me right, Martin, you're gonna you're gonna lose both of your legs, um, how could you play badminton? You somebody somewhere down the road you're saying right, okay, Martin, with your disability you need to do X. And with your disability, you need to do why. And there have been so many different disabilities out there. I think yeah, it's yeah. just absolutely incredible that you, you turn. So, and how do you, can I ask, how do you do that, Colin? How do you, what do you, what did you, what did you, what do you learn? What, how do you think you need to be different to other players? Do you think, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of things like um, feet, um, controlling feet direction, controlling stance, and balance must be a massive thing for you, right? So what well, what is it do you do? For for myself, when that when that accident happened, they said I'd be in the wheelchair the rest of my life. And I vowed I would never be in my wheelchair. I've got a wheelchair, I didn't want to use it. I've got crutches, I've got walking sticks. I didn't want to use all that. What what's for me as on the disability side, although I am disabled, I don't actually class myself as disabled. Yes. Because the club that I coach at, at Lothian Disability Bandman Club, I'm not disabled compared to some of the people that come in. So the one thing that stands out for me is some of the kids that I've coached one of them is his name's Logan Welsh. 
when he came to us, he was only five or six year old. And he turned around to me and he said to me, um, I, I can't walk properly because I wear leg braces. And he hadn't met me. I says, well, how about not having any legs? And he looked at me and he says, what do you mean? I says, well, I've not got any legs. And then I says, well, I'm playing international band and, and I'm going to try and go to the Olympics. Well, this five, six-year-old laddie turned around to me and says, well, Colin, I'm going to make the Olympics. Well, that just... So he's already set up in his mind what he's going to do. That, that we saying has stuck with me yeah. all that time. And now he's 10 or 11 now, and it's stuck with me all this time. Yeah. He's so determined... And he's so bright-eyed, and his disability that he's got, I mean, it's visible, everybody can see it, and it just opened my eyes. It really opened my eyes to having that young kid, and to me, to what I've got, and everything in between, as in wheelchair users, short stature, I've never dealt with short stature, the wheelchair players I've never dealt with, people with arms off, and and that we all come together yeah. and the coaching staff that we've got, we're all volunteers and the whole lot of us come together. And as long as we put smiles on everybody's faces in the disability group and we can go and share that with other people, that's, it makes life so much easier. A lot of it is for the pleasure and enjoyment and everybody, they still you still have competitiveness, you still want to... I'm just interested in how you. I guess. I, I guess there's no. There's no. That's the. That's the question. That's the point. There's no recipe. You know, everybody is so different. You know, when you have a room full of able-bodied people with no with nothing, there's nothing technically. Each one could be do to, to have to do different from another. Um, that's where, right. Where in disability, you're going to be saying, right, you need to work on X. You need to work on your balance. You need to work on that side you need to work on how you're going to get a wheelchair over there how you're going to going to get backwards how you're going to get forward fast That's you, right. you know or, and how you're going to hold a racket all of these right. kind of disabilities right yeah that's exactly right i mean when i first went to club in 2012 i was about 19 and a half stone and i've gone i've not held a racket for more than 10 years so how am i going to deal with this uh -huh. And Lyndon Williams, he's right, just get on and let us see what you can do. One thing that stuck with me, which I'm glad I've still got, is my racket skills. Yes. So although I've not got the movement on court like an able-bodied, I still think I'm able-bodied. So I get, I, they show me to the back of the court, they show me to the front of the court, they find my weakness, and I can't pick up on it because I'm too slow. Right, that's fine, but I enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, it's opened my eyes to what I can do. It helps that I can go to the NHS prosthetics department and say to them, look, I need this kind of set of legs to help me play the sport. They're more than willing to help me. So in the time that I played for 2012, I went through three sets of legs because I keep breaking the feet or... Um, I'm on court and they break and I just fall like a sack of spuds. It's funny as anything. But the very first tournament Lyndon got me into and it stuck with me was Scotstown, um, Scottish Four Nations, our English um, guy called Scott Richardson. He's a single leg amputee. His leg fell off while he was playing on court. And as he fell to the back of the court, he wiped out some uh, short stature. So the dwarfs, he knocked some of them down. It was like bowling pins. Well, I was in stitches. I'm not, I could not, I'm not allowed. Move. I'm not, and that I'm has not allowed to, me. to laugh. <laughs> You're not allowed to laugh. But that stuck with me. And for there, that's how I got the bug back. Because the group of people that's in playing the disability band and that is like one big huge family and they get these short stature are getting up and they're shaking their cell what just happened i'm i'm holding my sides laughing 
Scott Richardson's trying to look for his leg while trying not to laugh at what he's just done. <laughs> so from that day, that's what stuck with me, and it's been, it's. How did great. It, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a it's a mystery to me the whole the T T one T two all that stuff and and how you how do you obviously badminton players that you know inherently especially yourself are very competitive how do you measure when you're playing in a competition how do you measure the the disabilities because there's so many different disabilities what how do they measure what when right. you're going to compete with somebody how do they make it sorry. The, the way it works is, when I first joined, I can't, um, didn't hold me to this, I'm not sure how many categories there was. I think there was maybe 13 or 14 categories. Quite a lot then, right? Aye, okay. That was really a lot. So And age but, groups? No age groups, there's no right. age discrimination, anything right. like that, but it was more to do with disability. So when I first started, you had the amputees playing, then you have people with upper limbs off, they go to play, and field chairs played in there. So um, short stature played in another group, but they've narrowed it down now. So what happens now is my category is called SL3. Mm -hmm. So I'm a standing lower three player. So I either have, um, the way that works is you can have, be a double amputee like myself. You can have... Um, cerebral palsy, um, so CP players, and some players have got CP worse than others, yes. so they, they're put into the same category as myself. Now, there's only two uh, us in the world as double baloney amputees, the other ones are young lad in Brazil. So, they have to, so I'm in a minority with a disability on that, so they have to stick us somewhere. Yes. So that is classed as SL3 players. Yes. You've got SL4 players. So that's people with single leg amputations. So I'll go back to SL3 again. You could have a full leg amputation as well in your class as an SL3 player. So that's just your standing lower three. What about the differences if you're in a wheelchair and standing? Like, so that's, you could, so that's technically, you, technically, you could go in a wheelchair, right? So why would that be different? Technically, I'm one of four people in the world that could play in a wheelchair if I wanted to. Yes. But I've said from the very beginning, I refuse to play in a wheelchair. Yes. Unless I'm really, really bad, then I might have to. But yes. at the minute, I'm up from standing, I've refused to be in a wheelchair at the minute. I'll play in a wheelchair at club if one of your players is struggling and there's not another player really? to play against them. So I'll do that. Um, so there are other categories as... Um, Cerebral palsy again, but milder, so they play full court singles, um, along with some single baloney amputees. They are also SL4s. There's two categories of wheelchair players, um, so some can move their core better than the others, but I'm not exactly sure how they work. So that's wheelchair one and wheelchair two, and then everyone else is short stature, but they have to be under a recommended height and they're all the with dwarfism so um so they've actually reduced it quite to i think six categories because then you've got su5 so at standard upper five players so that's somebody with limbs off above um the waist so um shoulders they can't move hands off arms off something like that so but it's a real eye-opener um we have competitions here, um, or national disabilities. So I always try and get able-bodied badminton players to come along and have a look because it is the cream of the crop we've got in Scotland. But we've also hosted, well, England's hosted an actual nationals, a Great Britain nationals, and that's been great. So everybody in Britain that's got a disability can go along to it. And parents and uh, adults that are able body come along and see um, the last world championships there and there was with Switzerland it's the first time that they actually played uh, world championships and had the dis disability uh, world championships side by side and 
all the top players that were put, Momoto, um, Mia Bletchfield, all the Danish players were all coming and and they were flabbergasted on how well the disabled players were playing. And the comments that were given while we were standing or actually on court, they were in awe of us playing. And that that's just amazing. It's just beyond Talk belief. It's just beyond belief. The idea that somebody could I think as a player you you take for granted, you see it and you, I think that just I just think it's incredible that the, the way that somebody can um just, I think you you probably the, the only way you can rationalize it probably just trying to think of yourself playing with those disabilities. You know, if you had somebody tie your arm behind your back or whatever it was and just thought how could you play like that? You know, how can it, you know how what I mean the motivation, the determination and the they must just love it, though, right? I mean, East Lothian seems to be particularly, particularly big on it. Is, is East Lothian unusual compared to the rest of the Lothians? No, I think it's East Lothian because that's we actually train at Musselburgh um, Sports Centre. Yes, because we can't get facilities in Midlothian because Midlothian's all gymnastics at night time, so we can't get facilities for badminton. Um, so, but the rest Muscle of the Lothians, West Lothian, does it have it? Does well, we have got a club at West Lothian as well on a Wednesday evening, right. but that's mere for um, the learning difficulties. Right. So, the some guys, some of the guys have got downs and stuff like that, but they're really good players, and a few wheelchair players, and a few players that come from West Lothian to train on a Tuesday night with us also go to that club. Yeah, yeah, and I mean. One time at our club, our Scotland national team, there was nine players, and seven of the players actually come from the Lothian Disability Badminton Club. Hey, wow. So um, the other two come from um, Glasgow way. So we have the calibre of player, but unfortunately some of them have retired now or they just gave up through injury and they just can't play anymore. But I'm one of three at the minute that's still trying to play. Um, we're hoping next week we get good news because we've had new um, cause of COVID and all that nonsense that um, we've had new tournament um, dates set. So May we're supposed to finish off in Spain, which was the last qualifying event for the Olympics. Wow. Then in June we play in Ireland and playing in Ireland determines whether we reach the World Championships in Japan in October. So, and the just BWF have just um, announced the next two World Championships. So this year it's Japan, two years time it's going to be in Thailand. So, and, um, so the way we play it is we play a World Championships on the odd years and on the even years we play European Championships so next year I'm not sure where we'll be playing Europeans, I don't think it's been out yet the funding but, come from? Where does the money come from? A lot of begging, a lot of family it, and friends is um, Very lucky that I managed to uh, secure some um, funding for it's called Archer Hall which is through one of your Expats, um, Brilliant. she managed to get um, three years funding over the three years, but unfortunately, this year uh, obviously there's no money because of this has happened. Yeah, yeah. And then, local government, which is Midlothian Council, um, I get a wee bit of money for them, but they gave me the facilities for free, which is excellent. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I have an annual card to get into any facility in Midlothian Furnahan to train. Right. So swimming and gym and all the rest of it. So that helps out an awful lot. And what do you do outside and, of badminton, Colin? What do you do outside of sorry, badminton? Do, do you swim and stuff like that and walk? Or do you do anything else other than badminton? Well, I used to be a lifeguard um, oh. many years ago. So um, I trained just for upper body for when you used to go and save people. Yes. Um, then you use their legs, but now all I do is all upper body stuff. Shoulders, eh? um, but I've not. 
it's quite funny because I'm not got legs and I go into the swimming pool. Yes. If I do not kick my legs yes. and I do a front breaststroke arm, I go back the way. So I've got to, <laughs> okay. I don't know how it works yeah, okay. because obviously I've not got feet and I've actually asked the staff in, in the team video it, when I do a breaststroke forward movement, I actually go back the way. So I've got to do everyone front crawl. It's just crazy. Front so crawl. everyone's upper body for me anyway. So I've trained for that. You just but have a flow, but I guess you, I guess you'd have a flow between your legs and just do front crawl, do you? That's what I would do. Probably. No, I don't need that. No, no, I don't need no, it's nothing like that. So I'm quite a good swimmer. I've re I have been for years. So yeah. that's all my training and that's everything that I've done. And that's what you're training. So. And a, a, one thing I'm, I'm interested in is that it's technology and in, in your legs and you and your feet and your shoes yeah, and your yeah. movement. Um, how has that changed over the years? Right, right. When I first had my accident, what they gave me was. It was more or less a wooden foot, a metal shaft for a leg, and um, I've got a thing called a socket. I could actually take my leg off and let you see. Please. So I'll, I'll hold it up to you and let you see it. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning, that's what they gave me. But every month or so, I would break the wooden foot with a steel pole because it was only just screwed in. So I was more or less carrying a, a set of screws and a screwdriver with me wow. just so i could walk about places wow. so we changed that and then we went to um suction so same socket they slightly moved the leg to a wee bit more rigid leg but gave me a rubber foot and then they gave me just socks to put over my stump i would slide it into the um socket okay. and then I would go and do whatever. But if I was running about or I'd go and kick a ball, I would kick my leg further than what I kicked the ball and I would just fall like a sack of spuds. Honestly, it was ridiculous. So they changed it again and then what they've done is it's called a lanyard. So what I would have to do is they gave me a rubber sleeve to fit on my leg and on that rubber sleeve there was a small screw with a bit of string on it. So I would screw the screw to the rubber sleeve, then pull the string through the leg, bring it out the side of the leg, and I would pull. And as I pulled it, I would tie it up. That was that. But if the string broke, that was my leg stuck on my leg. I couldn't get it off. So I would have to go. It'd be at night time, guaranteed, or a weekend when the NHS is closed. I'd have to leave my leg on until I could go to them on a Monday morning. So that's naked. So now the same system I've kept up with since maybe 2007-2008 is I have a rubber sleeve and it's got a metal pin in it and it's like a ratchet system. So if I have my rubber sleeve, I have a pin that slots into the hole Yes. It would go through and you would hear it click in and so sort of click, 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 click. Yeah, yeah. And then that would hold it's it rigid. Locked. It's locked and then I have a small button on the side that would press and it would release everything. Yes, wow. But every now and then the technology breaks down. So at the minute I can get one of my legs. I'm just I'm I'm clicking it. I've just had a five minute warning call, right? Okay, okay, yeah. not a problem. Wow, is that graphite? This is um, graphite. For well, sorry, carbon fiber from. Uh, ah, it's cool, huh? It's cool. If right. ever you wanted someone to make you feel like a superhero, that's the one, right? Well, yeah. I've got this. This is my first original sports legs. Yes. The carbon fiber foot is different grades of carbon fiber, yeah. and I used to keep breaking them. So they've given me the highest grade of carbon fiber, which is inside this rubber foot. In this small box here is all springs and slight rotation because I asked for rotation so I could move on court. Oh, wow. I have a dampener here, which is oh. um, just a rubber suspension, and it's all held together with this, and this is titanium here. So it weighs about five kilos, this leg in itself. 
and then we have the socket and this is a wee button that I press to release Lisa. my ice ross. I'm not taking my ice ross off but if I lift my leg up slightly, I'll be as quick as I can. Can I ask you a question? Yes. What size of shoe do you take? Size 9. <laughs> <laughs> but I can, go, I can go from an 8 to an 11. <laughs> It's quite good. It's quite good because you could probably you could buy shoes on sale. You can see yeah, shoes yeah. for that, doesn't it, man? <laughs> That's what I do. I can sometimes get away with a size eight, and they're cheaper. And then sometimes I can go to a ten and eleven, depending on what kind of shoe it is. Was that, <laughs> tell me, was that a, was that a conscious decision? At some point, does somebody ask the question, "What size of shoe do you want to take?" No, no, at the very beginning they did to ask what was the size of feet you had, so Aye. they made the feet to that, eh? So, <laughs> so, so I shouldn't I shouldn't joke about it, but hey. No, so, that's what it's about. So this is my everyday that. walking leg, but this was my old sports leg. And right. now I have a set of uh like the running blades that you see on the TV, the guys are running. Yes. So a shorter version of them. So uh -huh. it's got same socket. But it's just a blade that runs down and it curves round and I've got uh, a rubber foot on that and that's what I use on the badminton court now. Brilliant. Much stronger, I'm more secure when I'm playing, so over the moon with them. Amazing, Colin. Right, we're going to go just good. I'm going to get cut off, so I want to say goodbye and I don't want to be rude and just get cut off, right? No, so, you're all right. Thank you, it was awesome. And we'll come again, we'll speak again, right? That was, that, was, that was awesome, Colin. Thank you. Cheers to that. Cheers. Have a great right. time. I'll see you on court soon, right? Cheers. Cheers.